Thanks for coming in today, guys. I'm Aaron Sullivan. I'm from Rackspace. And we also have uh, Rob Libert from Google and Adi also from Rackspace. And we're here to talk to you today about progress on our uh, collaboration on Open Power and Power 9, which is codenamed Zias for the motherboard. And then we have a Zias chassis and a Barrel IG2 system. We're, we don't have enough time in 20, 25 minutes to go through all the details that we'd like to in the session. We have published information online uh, over the last few months, and so you can find a very comprehensive slide deck on the OCP wiki. And our spec and our design package is there, and we update it regularly. So think about this as a very brief tour through the system. And uh, in order to start, we want to talk about the motherboard. Thank you, Aaron. As you said, I'm Rob Lippert. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I'm the engineering lead on our Power9 server project, which we've codenamed Zaius. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of Zaius and why we're actually interested in with Google. Um, this platform represents a lot of firsts for Google. It's our first open compute platform. It's our first platform that we developed in collaboration with a lot of industry partners. Uh, and it's our first demonstrator for 48 volt to point of load. So just a quick refresher or overview of the system, which we revealed last year. Um, it's got a lot, massive amount of compute capability. It's got two power nine sockets, 32 dims, it's got a um, massive amount of I.O. It's 80 lanes of Gen 4 PCIe. Uh, and of course, Gen 4 is two times as fast as Gen 3. Uh, in addition to PCIe, it's also got 32 lanes of 25 gig open copy. So that enables a new class of accelerators that are coherent, they're easier to program, and they can run faster. So we're also excited that we've got totally openness in the hardware and software stack. So the hardware is open, it's open compute. The software stack is open power. OpenBMC, et cetera, openness all throughout the stack. So as far as the actual server, what we have brought here today and what you can see is what we call the Google version of the tray. So it's compatible with our data center environment. And it's also compatible with the 48 volt OpenRack V2. It uses a horizontal bus bar connection. So it does not mate directly with the rack, but there's a deployment shelf that we've designed that allows it to mate with the rack. So all the I.O. and service access happens in the front. Uh, in the rear is just the fans and the power bus power connector. It's very compact. It's about as small as you can get and still be fit the board within it. Um, and it's also short. It's 1.5 OU tall. So we added a couple of Google-specific touches there, little things that we've learned over 10 years of developing servers. And we hope that it works well for everybody else as well. Thank you. Thanks. So we take the same motherboard and put it in a chassis like our Barrel I uh, chassis from our Power 8 system. We just call this chassis Barrel IG2, and we've made a number of improvements to it. Uh, it's also built to support a 48 volt open rack, more in the full depth variety that uh, many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's built with uh, a front I.O. service in mind, so you can service all of the drives and uh, every other aspect of it from the front. And you can see from the picture that there's a pullout tray. We will have a low profile chassis like we did last time, and then a taller chassis that supports room for uh, more, uh, more cards, more I.O., uh, GPUs, uh, CAPI devices, and so forth. And uh, that higher density system supports 25 drives, whereas the low one supports 15. So that's a quick overview of the system. For the rest of this, we have a lot of ground to cover, and we just wanted to touch on what we think are the most interesting parts of the system. Whether or not you are interested in open power or you're interested in some other system, the technologies that we show you here are groundbreaking for our community and our industry in general. So whether you're interested in PCI Gen 4 or coherency or anything else like that, you can hear from what we have observed and what we think is important for the rest of you as designers or manufacturers um, or, or, or people trying to build a whole end-to-end -end solution. So a lot of ground to cover very fast. This is the list of topics that we'll be going through. So we'll tell you a little bit about the family tree for the systems. We'll spend some time talking about how PCI and our BMC and the mezzanine are integrated. We broke some ground on uh, OCP mezzanine here. We'll talk a little bit about how NVLink and OPCAPI work in power, uh, some advancements there and some, some things we think you think are cool. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about barrelized storage design, about 48 volt in the rack and in the server and then a little bit about open power at the end. Uh, we're going to save questions 
for after the presentation. So we will be waiting outside. If you want to talk to us about this or ask questions, we figure we can give people more time if we go outside and let the next presenters continue on. So let's talk about the family tree first. So we start with the motherboard, which is common to both platforms. And then, as Rob said, Zias has a shelf and a sled to go into the rack that's very small and very simple and very low cost. And then Barrelli has two chassis. There's the 2OU I mentioned that has three different uh, mechanical cages to hold different I.O. cards in the front and uh, an option for one that's storage dense or we can remove that tray for a lower cost application. Then in the 1.25 OU variety, we have the same storage options, include the tray or not, and that just comes with one I.O. cage. That system is built more for people who are gonna value Power9's processing capability and not necessarily need all the I.O. or storage. So as we take this tour, you're gonna to see on the slides cutaways of these different parts of the system repeatedly. You're, you're gonna see the motherboard and then cutaways of the add-on PCBs that we put in for Barrel IG2 applications. So first stop is PCI Gen 4 and the OCP MES. So this motherboard has, uh, depending on how you wanna think about it, five or six Gen 4 PCIe slots. There's plenty of by 16, there's plenty of by 8, and we have an OCP mezzanine slot that'll do a by 8 or a by 16. And we even have an option if, for those that want to integrate host and BMC I.O. and video and so forth to use one of those mezzanine ports on, uh, on, on the by 8 to the right side of the, to your left side of the image uh, to integrate those. And for bandwidth, you know, we just put numbers on the board, it sinks in a little more, right? One single by 16 slot can do roughly 250 gigabits per second of bandwidth. So we'll talk about it in a minute, but we can, we can do a dual port 100 gig NIC at full rate in a single slot. And that's, that's pretty amazing. So our MES and that, uh, that pass through that I talked about that integrates host and, uh, and BMC IO, we'll stop there first. So we're using the same connector that you find in other OCP mezzanine solutions. It's just an upgraded version. It's mechanically compatible, and it will work with Gen 3 adapters. It's called Bergstack Plus in this particular case, and it has a variety of stack heights for different chassis, and you can buy this today. Um, depending on the kind of model you want to use, just look over on the right at the table here and then over on the left to see which connectors we use. We have an option if you want to have shared uh, shared uh, LAN on motherboard and VGA with the BMC, where you put in a by 8 MES, and then you can put a little uh, pass-through card in the other two slots, and that will link uh, on the PCI bus the mezzanine uh, slot with the BMC slot and give you some of the other capabilities. And then if you want a by 16 MES, you can't have the integrated uh, access, but you just don't use the interposer on those two far slots and just plug in a standard by 16 MES. And then there's no requirement to use uh, that interposer, even if you have a by 8 MES, you can just leave it empty. That is a picture of the interposer. It's a very small uh, piece of technology, and if you want to come by afterwards and look at it in the server, we can show it to you. As we said before, same OCP mezzanine receptacles. And we have full schematics of this aspect of the design available online for those that want to trace through it and think about using it in their own applications. Um, we did a fair bit of work with one of our partners, uh, Mellanox, to uh, get this MES working. This is their product. You saw it out on the show floor, dual port, 100 gig. But you can see it's a little unusual. The ports are stacked on top of each other. <laughs> Routing Gen 4 through a form factor this small with an ASIC like this is no small task. So you think about that for a minute and you think about all the bandwidth you can put through this card. Many of us would like to process data coming across a card like that, like in the Netronome presentation that you saw earlier. And there's just not enough space on the standard OCP 2.0 mezzanine form factor to support all of those memory and processing functions. So this is doable. But if you want your network card to be quite a bit more, we advocate that we look at, within the OCP community, moving to an OCP MES 3.0 standard. And there were talks about that this morning. But I think you could say a lot of what drove us there was lessons that we learned and shared on this. 
So we're going to pass this around for people that want to look at it. Please don't keep it and don't break any parts <laughs> off. <laughs> we'll pass a few more things around as we go. So next, let's talk about uh, OpenCAPI and NVLink. So closer to the motherboard, there are four ports, um, two per CPU in uh, the open power and open CAPI space. Those are known as bricks. Each slot is known as a brick. Each one of them uses a slim SAS connector. It's a 24G capable, but we do 25 gigabytes per brick. It's basically eight lanes of 25 gigabit. And you know, if you just do the byte math there, it's 25 gigabytes per brick. So this follows the uh, small form factor 8654 standard, which is out there today for uh, SAS standards. And we'll also hand out some connectors for that so you can see them. And we advocate uh, that everybody that is looking at coherency on other processor designs, other motherboards designs, you know, other chipsets, please consider using this connector. If you look at what's available with OcuLink and many others, you know, if it's, if it's a fixed connector in a laptop, it works pretty well. But it's, it's such a narrow connector that it's easy when you're servicing the cables to break them off. This is sturdy. It has room for more bandwidth. It has a clip-based release that holds the cable in. And we don't put cables this long in the chassis that we're passing around. But you, know, you can see there's plenty of very nice options for routing the cable in the chassis. And these products are already available. Just a little bit about the dimensions of those for those that aren't uh, able to see it. Pretty compact. And a little bit about the cables. Uh, we have a right angle connector cable here that you can see, but there's also straight cable connectors. We put those at the back of the deck for people that want to look online later. And again, here's the bandwidth readout. It's a very significant amount of bandwidth and much lower latency than over a PCI bus. One other area of ground we're breaking here is coherent processors or coherent adapter cards are going to start to become a thing too. And that will bring new mechanical and connector uh, problems also to the forefront. So within the OpenCAPI community, there has been work on developing card mount standards that can use a standard PCI slot that just cables off of that OpenCAPI brick that we talked about into the back of a card and uses PCI for maybe sideband management. We can run an extra wire for that and PCI for some supplemental power. Alternatively, for processors that have their own uh, their own slot architecture, we can develop mezzanine ports, which uh, you can see right along here, that will take maybe like an SXM2 connector or something like that, uh, uh, mate with a PCI slot below and provide 25G uh, open CAPI or, or other protocols. NVLink is also supported on this connector. So we don't have a standard for these kinds of cards right now. And in PCI, standard PCI card form factor, this makes pretty good sense. But for uh, card form factors that have more complicated sockets, I think we would benefit as a community in coming up with some standard proposed form factors. Otherwise, we will likely fragment in our community. Um, because there are so many connectors, because coherency is such a powerful concept and topic and likely to be more prevalent as time goes on, if we don't have to be thinking about the placement of the connectors in very different ways, the cutouts for the connectors in different ways, and the cable routing and so forth, we can avoid having this technology fragment our existing tray and motherboard standards that exist in OCP today. I'd like to say, no matter which processor I'm using, I can count on those connectors and cables and card mount options being the same. So we're going to pass this over to Adi for just a minute to talk about storage. Hey, I'm Adi. I'm going to talk about the storage design of uh, Battle IG2 server a little bit. So uh, there's, ma there's majorly three parts in the Battle IG2 uh, storage architecture. The first one is the host bus adapter. The host bus adapter connects to the storage expander board, and the storage expander board in turn connects to the drive back plane. The drive back plane has U.2 connectors on it. Uh, thereby, it supports the U.2 drives. So let's now dig a little bit deeper and understand how uh, the storage architecture looks today and what our plans for this in future are. So today, we test with uh, SAS SATA only, Broadcom HPA. And we route the SAS lanes via mini SAS connector to the expander board. The expander board has a SAS expander on it, uh, which basically fans out 
the incoming SAS lanes via a slim SAS connector to the drive back plane. So thus, we can support 24 by 1 SAS SATA drives in this back plane. But this is how it works today in EVT with the red boards that we have. But for DVT and production, we want, we want the server to be able to support NVMe on it, along with supporting SAS and SATA. So in other words, we want to add tri-mode support to this server. So with the, with the resources we have available today, um, in order to establish that, uh, this, is, this is the design that we've come, with, come up with. So instead of testing with SAS SATA only HPAs, we are testing with uh, Broadcom uh, Trimode HPAs or FPGA based, FP, uh, FBAs based on uh, uh, Xilinx or Nalatech. So along with the SAS lanes that we've al already routed in the design, we're going to route PCI lanes too to the expander board. We're going to have two PLX switches that fan out that incoming PCIe lanes to the drive back plane. Thus, we can support 8 by 4 NVMe drives and uh, 16 by 2 NVMe drives. So in other words, every, sla every slot would support SAS, SATA, and NVMe. So this looks like a neat design, right? Um, but if you kind of look at, look at it and uh, do, a, do a little bit of math, we had to route 88 high-speed lanes to the drive back plane. That's more or less the number of PCIe lanes on the motherboard. So you can understand the complexity in the drive back plane um, in order to make this transition. So to summarize, uh, we've come up with a solution to support SAS SATA and VME in the same uh, drive back plane, but it's not the most elegant solution. Uh, but with the resources that's available today, this is the best we could do. So us as a community, we need to kind of think about, uh, you know, as we make this NVMe and Trimode transition, we need to think about uh, next generation connector standards and, and protocol standards to kind of keep this in mind. Um, some of the stuff that's already being done is um, some uh, U.3 drives and connectors being proposed as a, a follow on to the U.2 uh, drives and connectors. So uh, there's gonna be, there should be more push for that. Um, and apart from that, uh, Trimode expanders need to be in uh, chip companies roadmaps. Um, this will help us integrate the PLX switch and the SAS expander into a single chip and thereby uh, save, a, save a lot of PCB space and uh, you know get us a more elegant solution. So now uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about 48 volts and uh, and how 48 volts in the server and how the voltage regulation is done on the motherboard and the adjoining boards. So the, the 48 volts input from the bus bar clip comes into the fan board in the barrel IG2 server case. Um, and the, the, the fan board has two 48 to 12 uh, del delta power bricks that convert 48 volts to 12 volts. So, and, the, and that 12 volts supply, uh, part of what comes in from the bu bus bar clip, uh, powers the fans, GPUs, expander, expander board, and the expander board in turn supplies 12 volts to the drive back plane. Part of the power supply that comes to the fan board um, also goes to the motherboard at 48 volts itself, not step down at 48 volts. In the Zayas chassis case, the bus power clip uh, power directly goes to the motherboard. There's a lot of interesting voltage regulation happening on the motherboard that we'll talk in detail in the next slide. So some of the parts where, where that happens is for CPU, DIMMs, and other accessories on the motherboard. Just to summarize all the voltage regulation that's happening on the motherboard. So now uh, let's dig a little bit deeper and understand the voltage regulation on the motherboard part. So you have 48 volt input coming in at uh, 42 amps. That's a lot of power. You have a hot swap controller that helps you buffer that incoming power supply. And you have uh, two CPU rails uh, that are supplied to power by the voltage regulators. Um, so there's some interesting aspects of these voltage regulators. Uh, all of them are point to load voltage regulators. 
and they do the 48 volt to 0.7 or 0.8 volts conversion in one step. They're also very efficient. They work at 90% efficiency. Um, Zeus and motherboard and Power9 CPU also support AVS bus, which uh, gives you a finer grain uh, power control for the CPU. There's also a bunch of uh, voltage, uh, there's two voltage regulators uh, that supply power to the dims. These are also point to load voltage regulators and they work at 90% efficiency. So those were the voltage regulators and the load for CPU uh, zero and you have corresponding, uh, equip, uh, corresponding uh, voltage equipment for uh, CPU one. And then you have, uh, for, for the rest of the motherboard, it's pretty standard. So what we do is basically take that 48, part of the part 48 volts that's coming in, uh, step it down to 12 volts, and then we have a net, uh, we have some equipment getting powered at 12 volts. For the rest of the equipment, uh, we have network of VRs that convert 12 volts down to the respective loads, like LOM or BMC or I2C functions. To, sum to summarize, the 48 volt point of, layer, point of load regulators um, and AVS bus helps us uh, provide a very uh, compact and efficient solution. And uh, the barrel IG2 add-on boards on the side um, gives you a choice to use the storage and GPU without actually routing all that kilowatt of power through that motherboard. So if you had a SKU that didn't, have, that didn't support all these, you have a really clean, elegant motherboard solution. Um, this being the first 48 volt power solution in OCP, uh, I hope this serves as a good reference. Now, Aaron will talk about a uh, 48 volt rack and the power shelf. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the clips and the rack solution here. Uh, we have some clips to pass out uh, as we talk about this as well, but uh, the clip that we use on the Barrel IG2 chassis today uh, looks about like what you see on screen and is located in the same basic location as the center bus bar uh, clip was in Barrel IG1. Uh, it is keyed differently. Uh, the bars, uh, if you just looked at them physically, are pressed together. They don't have a physical, a, a, a very visible physical separation between them. Uh, so there's no risk of uh, plugging a 48 volt device into the rack, uh, into a 12 volt rack and having a problem or vice versa. Um, in terms of the rack solution itself, the racks that we're looking at are 41 to 42 OU in size total. They carry one power zone. In that one power zone, we place a single 48 volt shelf. That 48 volt shelf is a little taller than in our Barrel IG1 platform, but it has as much capacity as two of the 12 volt power shelves did, and it maintains all of the same functions. So we keep an integrated ACS for dual feed networks, uh, and we were able to reclaim some space in the rack for additional equipment. Here's a closer look at the power shelf that we're using right now. This is from Delta, and it's 12 3 kilowatt modules. There's a PDU on the back, just like we had before for network devices and other things that need a conventional AC power. There are six ATS modules. Each one of those modules goes to a pair of power supplies. So our redundancy in this case, if you want to think about it, uh, it in, in terms of what could fail and how much capacity a guy could lose is 10 plus two. This shelf has about a peak 36 kilowatt output, but uh, with the loss of one ATS, we want to think about it more like a 30 kilowatt shelf. And it also includes a rack management controller like you've seen before. For those that want to do benchtop testing, a lunchbox was a very popular thing in Barrel IG1. Uh, in Barrel IG2, uh, it's been changed in design to connect a cable to the back of the server instead of mounting directly to the back. That makes uh, placement a little bit more flexible and eliminates any airflow uh, challenges that would keep people from hitting uh, sort of peak thermal capability of the main chassis. And we also made it work, uh, or designed it to work with 110 volt uh, power input. Previously, you, need to, you needed more than 200 volts. Uh, so you can see on the back side there, it should work in just about any, in, any environment now, even, even in your house. <laughs> uh, if you want to heat your house. Okay, so we're going to pass it back over to Rob for OpenBMC. <laughs> Thanks again, Aaron.
Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, in addition to the open hardware that goes with Zayas, we're also very interested in an open software stack to go along with the open hardware. And so we've committed for the Zayas program to working with our partners to produce a totally open firmware and BMC software environment stack that runs on the Zayas server. So that means there's no black boxes, there's no you know, little cores that have a, a binary firmware image or anything like that that are required to run the system. Uh, and that also means we're very happy to have external contributors download the firmware, modify it, and then contribute any modifications back to the community to help improve the server for anybody who's actually running it. So here's a quick link to the actual open, open power boot firmware, basically what we call the BIOS. Uh, it's already there, it's working, it's on GitHub. You can download it, you can compile it for a Zaya system, and it'll just boot right up. Uh, we've still got a little bit of work that we're working on at the moment to uh, add additional Zaya specific features, you know, some of the little hardware tweaks that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, as far as OpenBMC, again, it's, it's working. We've already committed a lot of support. We've still got a lot more to go. You can find it at that link there on GitHub, uh, OpenBMC slash OpenBMC, and you can just target the, the Zaya system and run BitBake, and, and you'll have a working BMC image that you can flash, and you can update it and run whatever applications that you would like to on the BMC. Okay, uh, this is no small task, integrating all this technology into one platform. And you've seen a little bit of the technologies we talked about, so we're taking a minute here both for appreciation of our partners that have also been involved in this process, and also so that if you're interested in some of these technologies and how we applied them, you can talk to some of these companies. Lots and lots of names here, and uh, we're looking forward to bringing a product out that involves all of these options uh, when we launch later. Our intention is to release this product for anybody else to build and consume uh, around the time that Power9 goes GA. The system is booting right now and running just fine, and we're looking forward to our DVT samples soon. So we hope you will join us. <laughs> we hope you hop on the open power bus and the open Cappy bus and all the rest of that. We might even give you a rocket to strap to your back. <laughs> if you want to participate, uh, please uh, let us know if you want some development samples in the next couple of weeks. And if you're an OpenCAP or NV League Solution developer, you're welcome to join. We've got links at the back of the deck for the mailing list and that detailed deck that I mentioned. And the design packages are already online on GitHub and on OCP's wiki, and we iterate on them periodically. Thank you again. <laughs>